to show all the old stuff. So, like, before I went to school in the morning, I'd watch, like, oh. all the old crap. What else was there? Uh, Wonder Years. Mm, I never watched Wonder Years. For me, it was Friends. Happy Days. That was like Friends was on Nickelodeon all the time. So I, tried, I tried to watch Friends, like, I don't know, two months ago. I just, it felt so... Stop, outdated. stop, 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 stop. Don't finish that sentence. I didn't I'm not like gonna it. like your... Oh, dude, dude, what the hell is wrong with you? Wait, what Lots. happened? No, nobody, nobody, nobody dislikes Friends. I dislike it's, Friends. It's got, it's got something for everybody. The, for the, sure. The big goofy you're, guy. You're, you're messed off. up. I am. The draft grade just went down. You're That's with... fine. Wait, the <laughs> big goofy you're guy so, turned you off? You were so hot with your face lately, too. You don't like Ross? <laughs> I what? You don't like Ross? Which Jim. one's Ross? See, I don't even watch the show. I just couldn't get into Schwim it. The Schwimmer. Schwimmer. Yeah, I don't like Schwimmer. Because he was in that OJ oh, show. He was in that OJ show on uh, FF. Yeah, he was. And he, he played, was talking uh, about that. He played Kardashian, and he was absolutely yeah. terrible in that. All he said was "juice." That's that was his only line. Juice. You're not wrong. Band of brother. Ah, damn! I just realized I for sure just made the intro hop right with that exploding about friends on Austin. You've been recording this whole time, haven't you? I don't know what you're talking about. I'm not recording. <laughs> Episode 10 of the VT Roundtable. We have a ton to talk about today. Um, just wrapping up the NFL draft. We spent so much time speculating, uh, doing big boards, talking about what the Vikings were going to do. And we got to all, watch it all play out last week. So now we're going to dive right in and start uh, prematurely judging all the decisions the Vikings made. Um, and we're going to rehash uh, everything that happened last week. And... We're going to try and predict how these guys are going to fit into the, the Vikings roster. We have some fresh faces to talk about, some new exciting players. So, um, like I said, we do, we do have a lot to talk about. So, we're just going to jump right in. We're going to go round by round just talking about these guys, getting everyone's input on, uh, on, our, on our new players. And then uh, we're going to drop some grades along the way. We're going to uh, drop some, some overall grades at the end of the episode and then just kind of chit-chat about, about what we think so uh, jumping right in, uh, you know, since we didn't have our first round pick, round two, uh, we, the Vikings started off the draft by moving up seven spots in the second round to take uh, Florida State running back Dalvin Cook. In exchange for Dalvin Cook, we sent the Bengals um, our, sec uh, our second round pick, um, obviously, and a fourth round pick. Uh, so a lot of people are really excited about this pick. Um, many people considered Cook to be a first-round talent. Probably, some some think he's probably a top three running back in this class. Um, however, he fell due to some injury concerns and some um, off-the-field issues. Uh, he was also a little little unimpressive at the, um, at the combine. Uh, but when you put the tape on, uh, you see a guy that's electrifying pretty much any time he touches the ball. So. Um, what do you guys think about this pick? I mean, who, who wants to start off talking about Dalvin Cook? Who's the most passionate about Dalvin Cook? I who think Austin might be. I, I think yeah. Austin might be the most passionate about Dalvin Cook. So. I, I think I gave it the best grade. Um, honestly, about this pick, I think I'm more surprised than anything else. I'm. I was surprised, and then that surprise turned into happiness because we got probably a first round talent in the second round. Um, and a player that I think fits really nicely in what Pat Shermer does, what the Vikings do, what they want to do. Uh, he can run in between the tackles. He can catch up the backfield. You go watch any highlight tape from Florida State. He can run wheel routes, catch down the field. Um, so I think we'll get to it later on. But Cook and some of the other players that they got through the draft really open up what the Vikings offense can do. So um, I think I gave it an A, and I, I think that's – that's perfectly reasonable given the fact that we got a first-round talent in the second round. You, you really can't ask for much more than that. Yeah, so I think it's worth, I think a couple of things are worth noting really quick. Um, so for everyone watching, we've already gone through, and the VT team has already graded all of these picks. Um, so we have a, we have, everyone has a grade for each pick, and then we've averaged the grades out. So we're going to be sharing those throughout the, uh, the episode. It's also worth noting that the last episode um, – we focused on just the first two rounds and talked about and these guys in detail. So um, go back and watch that if you haven't seen it already. Um, 
because we do have a lot of people to cover this episode, so we're probably not going to spend, you know, 20, 30 minutes on Dalvin Cook like we did the last episode. Um, so uh, who, who else was feeling passionate about Dalvin Cook? I got, I got um, BJ gave him an A+. Plus, and I know uh, BJ was kind of on the fence about when we were talking about best and worst picks of, the, of this, uh, this class, BJ was kind of on the fence about um, giving that award to Cook. So, BJ, why don't you talk about uh, Dalvin for a little? Yeah, yeah, I mean, Austin said it all, really. Um, this is an, a, an extremely well-rounded rusher. Um, you can really do it all. The pass protection issues, I think, are kind of minor. The more I watch him on tape, I think it's very fixable stuff that, you know, I, maybe over the next couple months he could become a professional-level blocker. Um, he's already better than Adrian Peterson, let's put it that way, in that regard. Um, outstanding pass catcher, can run – a pretty intense route tree. You can see him go vertical from the outside or the slot. You know, I just really love this player. And Austin said, you know, you get a blue chip running back at 41. Uh, that's a home run every single time, all the way around. I don't care how I look at it. This is an absolute steal for the Vikings. And they just got Adrian Peterson's successor in a big way. So do you, um, all right, so let's talk about the pros and cons of Dalvin Cook's game really quick. Um, sure. So, Pros, pros. He's a great pass catcher. Um, pros. He's he's agile. He's really good at running at the um, at the outside. He has great vision, great burst, uh, big playability. Balance. He's, he's balance. Balanced. Biggest thing. Um, and then I would say most of the cons I've noticed are the character issues, like we talked about. Um, we won't go into on into detail on those, but you can find them if you look for them. Um, and what then. And then uh, the I know BJ mentioned the blocking issue. Do you guys think that's a that's an issue with strength? I mean, I'm looking at his bench press right now. No, no, no. no. And his bench press was uh, 22 reps. So it's technical. I mean, I mean, it's technical. It's not, he's a beast. He's he's so, absolutely strong enough to put guys back. He just he's what, not technically fluid in that role. So this is something I wanted to ask you guys. And I don't know if you know this or not, but I mean, what about between the tackles? Is is he someone that you're gonna that that you think is gonna um, do well rushing up the middle, or? Oh yeah, I mean, I I don't have any doubts with it. He's got the size. He's like, and he's one of those fall forward type runners. Um, as far as you know, I think he's almost better in that regard than maybe Latavius Murray is. He just doesn't have the, the six foot three frame. So uh, I have no problem with Cook as far as ball carrier. I think just the pass protecting issue um, will, I guess, limit him and limit his snaps to begin his career, and I think as, as he kind of gets better in that, um, he'll eventually become the Vikings, possibly uh, an every-down player. So running through the grades really quick that we all gave Dalvin Cook, um, BJ gave him an A+, plus, Austin gave him an A, Adam hard Ernest, a. Uh, BJ gave him a hard A, um, which we all know is an A++++. Plus, 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 plus. Uh, <laughs> Adam and I were the lowest on Dalvin, so we gave him a B. Um, Let's hear from you guys. I want to hear from you guys. Adam? Sure. Do you uh, want to speak for us? I think the, the first instinct is to knock the pick because they had to trade up to make it, but I actually don't discredit the pick at all for trading up. They got 11 players in the draft while not having a first-round pick. That's uh, quantity-wise. You can't ask for much more than that, so I don't think the – the trade up hurt the Vikings that much at all, if any. Um, the the problem with Cook, for me, is that a he's a running back, and I think running back and safety are two positions where injuries have a high probability of cutting your your career short, or at least hampering it in a big way. And then on top of those odds that are already stacked against him because he's a running back, uh, are all this off the field stuff. Um, that, that we've all heard about the dogs and the arrests, multiple arrests and uh, whatnot. Um, and I just worry that this is going to be a Percy Harvin type scenario where he comes out, the value's there in the draft, we get him, hooray, honeymoon period, he goes on to be rookie of the year, best case scenario, you know, and then all this other stuff just comes down and bogs down his career in some fashion and, and the light bulb burns out quicker than any of us want it to for such a high pick. Uh, but that's all speculation at this point. And I think other than that outside stuff and the worries um, and the fumbles, uh, I think 
he's he's a very electric player that that uh, can add to this offense if the Vikings coaches can prove to us this coaching staff can prove to us that they can use a dynamic player like that. And when I say use them, I mean actually use them, unlike uh, what we saw out of Cordell Pats in the last few years. Um, yeah. So I, I don't think the need was there. I don't care. I'm not a need guy. Need guy. Uh, Rick Spielman said there comes a point where you say screw the need. Austin sent me that quote. Um, and I agree with that mentality, and, and the value is there. I, I do just worry that this is going to be a short-term pick because of other stuff. But he's a very talented player, and I, I hope that I'm wrong. Yeah, I mean, it, go ahead, BJ. What were you going to say? I was just, I was just going to you know make fun of him for how long it took to get out. We were talking about David Schwimmer and how long it takes him to get a sentence out. War was over here sp- speaking two miles an hour about Dalvin <laughs> Cook, pausing every two seconds. It sounds like you're not too confident in this analysis that you're giving, and I wouldn't be either because I really think that this kid is – you know, I like the take on the running back situ- the running back thing where, you know, he's not a great value positionally, but how much better can you do in a draft where you're getting a top 25 player with – there's no reason you should have even had, to, had that happen. I mean, nobody in the Vikings, you know, Spielman all the way down didn't think it was anywhere close to possible. You can't Forest do Lamp. better than that. Forrest right. Lamp. I mean, Forrest you guys got to let that dream die. you got to let that dream die. It wasn't a dream, though. Like they, they had a realistic chance. They were—he was right there. What, do you, what was he? What forty or thirty? Okay, what is, hey, we got to talk about what realistic means here. Teams can say no to trades. Sure. You, guys, yeah. you guys know that, right? I mean, San Diego. Yeah. San Diego has, a, has as much of an offensive guard issue as the Vikes do. So basically, it was Seattle. That's it. And they failed to get it at Seattle. It's about who wants it more. You don't think if the Vikings would have offered more than the Chargers, then they would have gotten that instead no. of the Chargers? Chargers have like the second worst offensive line in the NFL. No, but they I'm saying, but I'm saying, if the Vikings didn't offer, seconds. if the Vikings, if the Vikings had offered more for that spot than the Chargers did, you don't think that we would have been able to to move up and get them? Here's the thing: Rick would have got his picks back. He, he's shown that yeah. he's going to get his picks. But he's going to trade down and down and down. And he's he, a lot of the drafts would have probably been the same anyway, to be honest. So I think I mean my gripe, and, and I was kind of joking about it in the chat because because I have been saying it's a B because it's not Lamp, right? Dalvin uh, Cook is great. He's a value pick. He he, he was clear, you know, clearly the best player on our board at the at the at the time. Um, but it was also my nightmare scenario. I mean, I think if you go back and watch the dream and nightmare scenario, I think my I said my nightmare scenario is us trading up to select a running back in the second round. True. Because so a B is not so bad, huh? Well, yeah, and and, and, so and, 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 I, and I and I gave yeah, it a B because I I gave it a B because I think um, Cook could be a blue chip player, and and I agree with Adam that you know we do need to go BPA, but I think. Sometimes your BPA should be determined by. Um, I, I I do think the needs of the team should weigh into it, and I think the position, um, uh, um, you know, should weigh into into uh, your BPA. And so, you know, I feel like the, this running back class was very deep. Um, I would have preferred us move up and take Forrest Lamp and potentially address running back in a later round. And I've said in previous episodes that I would have been fine had we not addressed running back at all this year in the draft. Yeah. So. Um, that was my biggest gripe with the pick. I, with that being said, I'm very excited about Cook. Um, I think he could be. I think our backfield now it could, you know, could instantly become one of the best in the league, uh, pending our offensive line being competent this year. Um, but that's the big question mark, isn't it? Um, yeah, our offensive line. I agree line with being you, competent. Brett. That that the biggest knock on Dalvin Cook is that he is not Forrest Lamp and he does not qualify as Ham. But other than that, I do <laughs> like what Spielman did. Let's remember when this team drafted the the best running back in team history, they did not need a running back. Chester Taylor was coming off a thousand yard season and but he got too. player available and a little different situation, obviously. But um, if it wasn't going to be Forrest Lamp, I'm happy with this pick. That's why I probably gave it a B plus or an A minus. I can't yeah. Remember. So okay. So so to wrap this pick up, um, Drew gave it an A minus. <laughs> Sam gave it an A minus. That averaged as a three point six, which is right below an A minus. So it's like B plus A minus. Uh, so yeah. VT official grade for the Dalvin Cook pick. We'll just say A minus. We'll, we'll round up. Can one of you guys just bring up that he fumbles like Adrian Peterson? 
real quick because you're trying to trash him. No. At least talk about how he that never is, gets up, and that's why he fumbles the ball because yeah. he never he never goes down. The ball slips out, and that's where the fumbleitis is from. He looks just like Adrian Peterson in that regard. We're so, in yeah. denial. We don't want to believe it. No one wants to trash him. We love him. He's yeah. a member of our family now. Well, you guys are trying to find reasons not. wrong with this guy. The off-field yeah, issue is are. one thing, but everything else is just like, like I mean, Moore said it's speculation. Well, but and, and I and I want to say that because that's something, I was, that, that's something I was thinking about with this episode. We're going to be speculating a lot about these guys during this episode, right? Really? And, well, and, and and none of us are. I'm not going to sit here and pretend to be a scout, and I'm not going to sit here and pretend to be learned on all eleven of these guys to you know the most minute details. But that's part of the fun of talking about the draft is we got to we got to analyze the picks that were made. We got to be talking about value. We got to use what we know about these guys. To kind of make a you know early prediction or judgment on on how they're going to pan out. So I want to say, to, if any of the players that got drafted by the Vikings are out there watching the roundtable right now, because we know you know the subscriber counts moving up, we're getting a lot of people watching now. <laughs> ben Gideon, if you're out there, man, it's not Uh-oh. personal when we get to that pick. We hope you. We hope. It's really personal. We hope you are the <laughs> best linebacker the Vikings have ever drafted. Um, so, so yeah, there's going to be speculation. I'm going to tweet this at him for sure. You I'm absolutely not. tweeting this. <laughs> absolutely. He's a psychopath. He's going to love that. It's going right. to be unreal for him. I love you, Ben. All right. <laughs> we're we're going to move on to round three, okay? So, um, round three, uh, the Vikings decided to move up again. Uh, this time they moved up nine spots, and they ended up taking center Pat Elfline from Ohio State. Uh, we gave up our third round pick. Um, as well as our fifth round pick. I forget who we traded into that spot with. Um, I don't have it written down here. It doesn't really matter, though. It doesn't. Matter. It, does, anyway, it, so. it doesn't really matter. Um, so Elfline, uh, the kind of the quick report on him is uh, he's technically savvy. He's very smart. Um, he excels at run blocking. Um, could use some work in pass blocking. Not super athletic. Uh, he's versatile. He played at, um, I think it was it was it three years at guard at Ohio State or two years at guard at Ohio State, and then he moved to center in his final year. Um, yeah. Zimmer's already came out and said that they project him uh, playing at center. Um, so, what about this one, guys? I mean, uh, I think the highest grade we have on this is my grade, and I think um, Sam um, had him as his best player. So, Sam, you want to talk about some ham? I know, I know you love your ham, man. Yeah, big fan of Pat Elfline, big fan of the pick. Uh, he's adorable, and um, he, mm-hmm. you know, he looks the part in terms of a, an interior offensive lineman. Um, love his tape, and like you mentioned, Brett, the positional flexibility, uh, the fact that he not only can play guard and tackle, but he's excelled at both positions is going to help this team a lot. And the fact that Zimmer said already that they're projecting him as a center, that tells us this is your opening opening day starter, guys. This is your opening day starter at center. They wouldn't have said that and had him learn behind Berger or something when they invested such a high pick. So I think they're going to try to move Berger to guard, and um, at the very least, you have some flexibility with what you, you can do with those two guys. So just that infusion of talent in the middle of the offensive line I think is going to be a huge help if Elfline does go through this season healthy. Um, I think it's going to improve the run game dramatically and pass game probably too to some degree. So, um, I mean, do we do we have so what are the concerns that we have about Elfline? I mean, I mentioned the pass blocking, but when you put him at center, I think that that probably gets mitigated a little bit. Um, right. Would you agree, Joe? Well, but keep in mind, sorry, real quick. Keep in mind, center is is calling out your your uh, protections and your line calls. Right, but so there but that's... there hasn't been any question about what's upstairs for him as far as playing center. The the question's mm-hmm. more athletically. Um, mm-hmm. You know, does he have the speed to to move? Um, to move around, but like I was saying, when you're when you're at center, you're kind of just a, a mass at that point, um, more, more or less. Uh, so I don't know. What do you think, Drew? I know I know you you were kind of fond of this pick as well. Well, yeah. I mean, I think from a technical standpoint, I think he's the most pro ready interior lineman um, in the in the draft. I thought he was, and you know, when you see his athletic numbers and kind of his footwork, it's not it doesn't wow you. But I think that kind of scares some teams away. And the Vikings are able to get a guy that, you know, if they, especially if they plug him at center, they can hide some of that. So um, I I love the pick. I think they're going to – if you get a day one starter in the third round, which, I mean, is what they essentially did, uh, you, you did a really good job. And it was definitely worth the trade-up for Rick. And uh, I think he's going to be, for the next decade, he could be a starting 
center or guard, whatever you need uh, in the NFL. So, so Mike Mayock basically echoed what you just said, or you echoed what Mike Mayock, I guess, said. He echoed um, what I said. Oh, okay. I, just, yeah. I, I thought so. Yeah. Um, he called them, <clears throat> quote, one of those guys that will play 10 years in the NFL, end quote. <clears throat> so, I mean, that's pretty – that, that's pretty high praise, and, and to be able to get a guy in the third round that Mayock thinks is an immediate ten-year starter at a position of need, um, I'm not I'm not sure what else we could have asked for with that pick. Um, is there anybody that didn't like the pick? I mean, looking at looking through the grades, um, I think our lowest grade was Adam again. Um, Adam, man, how come we can't get an A out of you? It's hard to please. Yeah, let me just say a B is a good grade out of me. I. Uh, Maybe I grade tougher, but no, I, I don't have much issue with the pick other than the pass protection concerns, and I think that um, hopefully will be something he grows out of. And, and uh, if anything, to Sam's point, he's nothing but highly regarded in terms of his intelligence and, and <clears throat> football savvy and locker room leadership by all accounts that I've read, and, and uh, hope that he is our center for the next 10 years um, and can follow in some pretty good footsteps with – Sullivan and Matt Berg. I got no problems with this So, pick. is there anyone that wants to add anything else about this pick? No, we all love we all love Elf. Watch, watch episode nine for my take. Yeah, go back and watch episode nine. Plug. That's a good um, plug right there. It's savvy. Yeah. yeah. So, after the Elf line pick, um, Slick Rick started doing his thing. Uh, moved around a ton uh, following that pick. Uh, he moved down to the. Uh, bottom of the third round, um, well, we, we traded our second round pick to the, the second third round pick to the Chiefs, moved to the bottom of the round, we gained a fourth and a seventh, and then we traded out of the third round completely just after everyone in our live chat had been waiting, and and uh, and, then, <laughs> and, then, and then we ended up not picking again. So, um, uh, so we traded out of the third round entirely, gave that pick to San Francisco, and ended up acquiring another seventh round pick. Um, and that put us at the top of the fourth round right after Green Bay. And with that pick, um, uh, we took uh, Jaleel Johnson, defensive tackle, Iowa. Uh, kind of some insurance potentially for Sharif Floyd. I know it was all of us kind of talked about DT being a, pos a position of need, not knowing uh, where Floyd is at and, and some of the age on at the defensive tackle position. Um, he's versatile. He's... He's uh, kind of a, a run stuffer first, but he, uh, I, I have heard him talked about as a pass rusher and a run stuffer. Um, however, I think his pass rushing is more of a, what, what, I've, what I've heard and what I've seen is just he's more of a, a strength pass rusher as, a, as opposed to like a, a technical pass rusher or someone who has a large arsenal of, um, of rushing moves. Um, so, BJ, you got a ton of love um, in our in our YouTube comments, I think I think you like predicted this pick or something, or or you said it could happen, or this was kind of your guy. So you want to talk about him a little bit, or uh, I'm trying to dial back the passion here because you, as your grades do not reflect the enthusiasm you're showing here today. So um, just overall, I mean, great play. I mean, I'm not getting the, the high passion level from you guys. There's slow, you guys are slow talking it. I mean, it doesn't sound like there's any excitement here, and I'm like up here like. You know, That's how you always I mean, I can't be this much more enthusiastic about this class. I mean, Sam brings some fire every now and then. Austin kind of quiet in the corner, hasn't talked in a couple rounds here. I'm just, <laughs> just saying. Talk. I'm just saying. I'm trying. To, I'm. I'm asking you guys to bring the fire Look, here. BJ, I feel I'll that. Say. I feel that Robert that. has begun grading us now. Instead <laughs> yeah, of absolutely. Absolutely. And absolutely. I don't know how to feel about this. I want to see some fire. I want to see some, like, some hotter takes. I'll say this much about Jalil Johnson. He's the first player that I've kind of taken notice of because of what we call draft Twitter, which I don't feel like I've given enough love or given love to is, is the dudes who grind every day watching film. Students kind of like Drew, you know, a guy that watched. I wouldn't say you're part of draft Twitter, but I, I would say you that, – that's not, that's not a – <laughs> that, that's not a bad thing. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. But I feel like Jaleel, Jaleel Johnson is the first guy that I've seen or taken notice of because people on draft Twitter have pushed his name. And it was kind of cool to see someone uh, come out of nowhere and land with the Vikings and see, like, these dudes who 
work just as hard as people who write or do podcasts or whatnot, uh, kind of campaign for him and, and someone that people potentially missed on. So this could be a fourth round pick with second round talent. We just don't know. But yeah, that's kind of how I feel about it. I think he could be an exciting player. I don't necessarily yeah. know enough to be fiery like BJ is, but yeah, um, BJ, why don't you show the oh fire, God, man? I have been. I mean, I'm, I've been screaming for three rounds here. You, yeah. You well, I actually, every I single, do it. while you mentioned right, that, every can, single can, time I talk, you give me the. Can you well, can you tone it down a little bit because we did get a comment about your your. Uh, oh yeah, he knows. Right. He knows. He knows. <laughs> we knocked it out. He knows what to expect out of me. I mean. I'm sorry. This, this is this is where I'm at when I'm talking about the draft class. I mean, you know, it's an exciting group. I've got a lot to say. And I'm just glad we didn't draft any cornerback because BJ would we would be able to contain. BJ. Wait, so you wouldn't get out of here tonight, no doubt. So I mean, but we all loved the we all loved the Jaleel Johnson pick. The lowest grade that anyone gave for it was a B. And now I'm just, I mean, I'm just I'm totally like just messing. I'm having fun here. I'm trying to just amp it up a little bit. That's all. Oh, I'm, no I'm, one's like, mad. I'm having fun. No one's mad at I mean, you. We, we want you to have fun. No, but you guys keep you guys keep giving me these <laughs> every single time. I kind of like say like something like you know we got to amp it up. There's got to be some more passion. You're giving me these. Well now, well, now we're aware of it, so we're, we're very conscious okay. of it. Now. <laughs> yeah, let's, just, all, let's just, all glare at BJ now. Just shake our I heads. mean, you guys always are, anyways, because I'm always talking too much, so I don't know. I'm just asking for a little bit of enthusiasm. That's guys, all. my favorite That's things fair. about Jaleel Johnson are his motor, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. number one, and tremendous arm length, and he uses that to keep blockers off of him. And um, like Brad mentioned, yeah, he's more of a bull rush, more of a strength guy. Definitely a one-gap guy that, more than a two-gap guy, but that fits perfectly into the three technique. Also, uh, officially now, to me, Sharif Floyd is now the Vikings version of Nikola Pekovic, where, hey, oh real down. I love that comparison. But, I love that. He, he's killing it. If you're getting anything out of him, that's Look. a bonus at this point. So I think that's why they drafted Johnson, and um, I think he's going to be a good pick. Sam is experienced in front Fire. of the camera, okay? This comes natural that. for him. Yeah, it's natural. Drew, I that was unreal. Like that. That's was, exactly what I'm asking for. I was pandering to Drew a little bit there. That is terrific. Thank I love that. Thank you. Yeah, Drew's a star, man. You can't hold us to the – I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, Sam's star. a star. Well, you're a star too, Drew. But Sam, Sam is a star. You can't hold us to the same standard, you, BJ, as Sam. Where are you getting this information? You guys all have a high bar on uh, my the bump, and, the bump and run. Uh, oh, yes. Coveted. Yeah. YouTube show. I mean, you, you have like tons of likes, tons of subscribers on there. I mean, if people watching the show haven't seen Bump and Run, I, they, they're missing out. But um, thank you, Brett. Yeah, for that weekly plug. What does Adam think about Jaleel Johnson? Fine pick. <laughs> All right. Go. That's it. There we go. All right. So maybe we'll get some passion in this next pick. Um, in I want to know what would happen if we muted BJ for like the next fifteen minutes, but made him stay. But made him stay on, so we could all just watch him. <laughs> I mean, I have... Yeah, don't, tell, don't tell him he's muted. I've got six twitches for us. You've got Not as punishment, just as sort of a social experiment. We just see what happens. Watch Benny for a little bit here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, um, Enjoy yourselves. I think, I think there's some strong feelings about the next pick as well, except for Adam, who has no feelings. Um, he's just given B's all the way across the board. Um, he gets degrees. But uh, so with with the Vikings' second fourth round pick, we selected Ben Gideon, um, uh, inside linebacker, probably Michigan. Uh, I don't really have a whole lot to say about Ben Gideon. Um, this was probably the the first pick of the draft where people kind of scratch their head and. And, uh, I mean, obviously our big board isn't uh, the Vikings' big board, um, but it is a consensus big board and had, you know, the the grades of 12 experts averaged out and you had to go pretty far down on it to find Ben Gideon. So right out of the gate, I think there was some, some eyebrows raised about this selection. Um, I'm not really sure uh, what... Uh, I mean, d does he pop out to anyone as having one huge strength or something he can bring to the team right away? Um, Special teams. Yeah. So, I mean, and that's basically what I've heard from pretty much everyone is that he'll probably going to be a really solid special teams contributor. Um, right. And but I mean, I mean, that's that's the issue with the pick is that it's he's a special teams guy, and you're doing that in the fourth round. Uh, I mean, he's which, he's probably a 
a backup middle linebacker. Um, you know, I think the weird thing about Gideon is that his athleticism didn't show up when you watch his Michigan games, but he tested really well. So I guess we'll see how that turns out, you know, at training camp. But um, from what I saw, he's a special teams guy, and he's a backup and a linebacker, and that's not what you want to be drafting in the fourth round. I think that's more of a sixth-round guy yeah. that you're looking to add. So that's I think that's why everybody's having problems with so, pick, I think. But, I, so I think we should probably say that by the time you get to the fourth round, if your expectations are – plugging in a guy from the fourth round as a day one starter at a position of need, then you're probably kind of setting yourself up to be disappointed. Um, I think Jaleel Johnson may be an exception there, but I think if you go back and look at the Vikings fourth round picks and a lot of fourth round picks from other teams, at this point, you're kind of looking for developmental guys, maybe with high upside or guys who've had character issues that have fallen in the draft. Um, and that's why I have an issue with this pick. Right, that's, and that's why I personally have an issue with it. Yeah, and that's what I was going to say, too, is Ben Gideon is neither of those things, as far as I can tell. He's not someone that fell due to off-the-field issues or injury issues, and he's not someone that really offers a lot of high upside. So right. I, I kind of just think it was a, a, a depth pick that uh, I, I, I don't know. I, well, didn't, didn't they lose Audi Cole in the offseason? Yes, Jaguars. Yeah, I mean, so I get it's a it's he's like Kentrell Brothers 2.0. He's gonna be a really solid special teams guy. He could end up being your Heath Farwell. How long was Heath Farwell on the team? Uh, that was the point I was gonna make. If he does end up being Heath Farwell or Chris Walsh or some sort of special teams yep. dynamo, then the pick looks great. It doesn't matter if it's fourth, fifth, or sixth or right. seventh round. It looks great. But that seems like a big if. The only thing that gives me confidence is that. He's going to play on a Mike Pre for special teams or a Mike Zimmer defense or both. So one or both of those guys signed off on this pick, which gives me some optimism. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I think I think that you guys should be optimistic about his athleticism as a whole. He's a really high spark guy, which is something that Seattle is really high on. I don't know a thing about it, mm-hmm. but it's athleticism testing spark. Seattle drafts all their linebackers through spark. Think about who their linebackers are. Bobby Wagner, KJ Wright. So that's a reason for optimism in my mind. Um, because he is that type of guy that can range side to side. And at the same time, I hated this pick because four or five picks later, Jalen Reeves made it off the board to Detroit, and that's your high upside, low floor, gamble pick in the fourth round at a position of need with cover skills. So that's why, overall, that's why I wasn't happy with the Gideon pick. So, sorry, we're gonna, we'll, we'll come back to that, BJ, but Austin's got to run, so I just didn't want you to leave without us saying goodbye. I was trying to wave... Oh, casually. Austin, Austin had. Oh, oh. Now, did someone <laughs> boot him, or did he just come and go again? I, uh, I think that's how Austin rolls. It's kind of an okay, Irish I'm goodbye. Not, he, he's trying to get back in again, but I'm not going to let him back in. Gone. And, and then, then we I lost th- Adam. Yeah, oh my goodness. Yeah, we're having some technical difficulties. Oh my god. Now Austin's back. But I have a really bad way of interrupting this show, whether it's me or my mom or someone. <laughs> Yeah, um, sorry. This just adds to the excitement of the show. These technical. Yeah, this is a, this. I love this. Yeah. Um, so yeah Austin, should, everyone's moving around too. Austin, thanks for joining us, and yeah. I, I know we know you got to go. So uh, don't you got a back. date? Where are you going? I don't. No, I got to help someone with some homework. Uh, all right. Sounds like a, that sounds like a date to me. Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Austin. <laughs> thanks, man. See you guys. Yeah. All right, bye. Adam, That's a date. You, Adam, That's a one hundred percent date. Yeah. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you. Can you not see us, though? No, nah, I'm having some issues, but that's all right. I'll roll with it's it. It's okay. We don't need to okay. see us, okay, as long as we can see you. As long as the people can see that face over there, that's all that really matters. Yeah, that's, that's the important part. <clears throat> so Guys, anyway. I, I also I think it was very underwhelming when it happened, but I actually am not so down on it after researching and thinking about it a little bit more. I do you think they're looking for that third linebacker who's not going to play that much? He's going to play 30, 35% of the time. And I think that's what they're hoping to fill with Gideon, whether or not he'll do it, who knows. But you mentioned the special teams. That's true, too. The, the, the scouting reports I have on Gideon say he does, is a good athlete, does have good spark score, like BJ said there, but he's just not great in coverage. And so I think they're just going to try to use him as a run-down linebacker. And obviously you can't hide him in coverage completely, but um, Zimmer will do what he can. So I'm interested to see what they do with this because it did seem underwhelming, but I feel like there was a reason they picked him in the fourth round and um, they were targeting for something. I just think it's try, try to play him on rundowns. 
Yeah, Part so, of the issue with him, too, is that he played on Michigan's defense with all those st- superstars out there that he kind of gets, you know, you don't see him on film at all unless you're looking for him. You got Wormley out there, Peppers, you know, all of these unbelievable studs that are just making plays all over the place. And then there's Gideon just making you, you know, standard four-yard rush attempt tackle. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's kind of the player he is. And honestly, I think he's a little bit of Chad, Chad Greenway White. Uh, that's, you know, I don't think that, you know, people don't like that because they hate the Gideon pick, but he looks a lot like Greenway in terms of athleticism, his kind of his ranginess across the field, and his ability to wrap up and make tackles and just be an absolute psychopath out there. Fearless player. Does not care. Gives up the body. That looks, that sounds like Chad Greenway to me. So there's your upside for, on my pick. I still gave it, I still gave it a D. Yeah, so running through, we got a, we got a D, a C, a B, C minus, C minus, and a B minus, putting us at a, a basically a 2.0. Uh, for that grade, which makes it a C. So we the whole team averaged at about a C for the Gideon pick. But uh, prove us wrong, please, Gideon. We want to be wrong. We, we hope this is a, a great pick. So uh, Next pick, Rodney Adams, wide receiver out of South Florida. Um, this was kind of another head scratcher to me. I'm not going to lie. Um, I don't I, – I, I'm not sure I see where he fits in in this wide receiver group. Um, it sounds like from everything I've been able to gather that he's basically going to be a special teams guy, maybe a kick returner, um, maybe a gadget player, has a lot of speed, uh, kind of like Cordero Patterson, but unlike Cordero Patterson, has a very slight frame, um, so maybe he won't be able to do some of that gadget stuff. Um, maybe he won't be able to take some of those that those hits that, that we kind of know Patterson for on his end of rounds where he'd break three or four tackles and continue pushing through. Um, so... This one was kind of a, another one that I graded low. It was probably my, my second to lowest grade for this draft. Um, the highest grade I think we got on this was from BJ, um, Mr. Passion over there. So, BJ, <laughs> so tell us about cool. Rodney, man. What, what's, up with, what's up with Rodney Adams? What do you like about him? Uh, for one, he's going to step in and be a starter on special teams. This is your kick return guy. Um, I'll bet the house on that right now. He's going to start a kick mm-hmm. return for the Vikings week one. Um, electric talent. Um, he's a... He's a, a very a skinnier, slower version of Cordero Patterson. Stream gadget player, zero, zero receiving skills. A uh, ton to develop in terms of a route tree. He basically can run a nine and, you know, do end arounds and then be kind of like a decoy and then also do kind of some of that really basic screen, bubble screen stuff and, you know, try to take it to the house. So he's a home run threat every time he touches the ball. Great field vision. He does have a fumbling issue, but as a whole, I think he – it's another guy that brings value to this team. So this is, what I'm like not, this is what I'm not getting is um, we're saying he's like Patterson, but he's not as big. He's not as strong. He's type not as, of player. He's not, as, of he's player. not as athletic, and we're going to put him at kick returner, and he has fumble mm-hmm. issues. So but this is the t- we're talking we're talking type of player here, right? He's a, he's a gadget receiver with very little fundamental ability in the receiving game. He can't run routes, but if you get him the ball, you find a way to manufacture touches. He looks just like Cordero Patterson because of that second gear and that breakaway speed that he has. Yeah, so he does That's have he, he does have four four speed, um, uh, and he yeah. had a really high broad jump at the at the combine, which shows some explosiveness and a and a pretty good like sixty yard shuttle. So yeah, there and is Brad, the- you know that this coaching staff has been very loose about getting receivers on the field if they're not good route runners and don't understand the offense, right? So I, 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 I think he, he'll get plenty to run. Yeah. So, um, no, what? No, they wouldn't get Coriel Patterson on the field. He was better than this guy, bigger, faster, stronger, better smile. And so they're not going to get this guy on the field. He's a kick returner at best. That's it. I hate the pick. You- I like it. <laughs> Yeah, so, like it. so you did cut out for some of that, but I but I think I can salvage it. Um, oh, I think God, I think your I'm computer sorry. doesn't like when you get upset, Sam. All right, all right, Hold so, relax. Yeah. I'm sorry. It's kind sorry, of a catch twenty two. Uh, not a big Because if, rela- if you relax too much, then you got BJ yelling at you to get more pumped. And then if you get pumped, your computer basically melts down. So. You're kind of in a pickle. I think it's my Wi-Fi. I did have it working well, but I don't know what's going on this now. Anyway, um, what do others have to say about That was so unreal. <laughs> Dude, you were like speaking through like a, like a tunnel, and it was like... I'm 
gonna have to I edit so off. much out of this episode. Guys, I should probably just take off here. It's just it's no. not working tonight. No, hey, no, no this is great. It's it, it, it's no, guys. It, 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 it's fine now. Just don't get too riled up, okay? Just we need you this to relax a little bit. This entire thing has been entertainment. This All right, entire so look, show. We, we, <laughs> look, we got two more guys. We got two more guys, then we got the seventh round guys. So let's just keep keep pushing along, okay? okay. Uh, round five, Danny Isadora, guard Miami. Somebody tell me about Danny Isadora, please, quickly. Uh, he's an athletic guard, a uh, good uh, pull blocker at Miami. Uh, his issues are kind of in, you know, he's not strong. He can't handle pull rushes very well. Um, so that obviously, uh, as an interior offensive lineman, um, that can be a problem. But um, I think he's a developmental project, and he can eventually be the, the starting, a starting right guard, I think, um, especially when Joe Berger retires. I think there'll be an opening there. And I think Isidoro will be kind of the favorite to be that guy. So uh, I think he did slip a little bit. In the draft, I think I kind of had him in the, in the fourth round, late fourth round. So uh, I thought I thought it was a good value here for for Spielman, and uh, I think if you're getting a guy that potentially could be a starter within a year or two, um, which I think is the case for Isidore, I think it's a great pick. So uh, I mean, Sam got his ham. So uh, I I mean I gave it what yeah, a minus. What the heck? Yeah. What the heck, Sam? Everyone gives this pick an A, and then Mr. Ham down here, who is just dying to get offensive linemen, gives it a B plus. I mean, is there oh, something specific? Did Adam give it an A? Well, yeah, actually, yeah, yeah Adam did, did give it an A. It's like the, the first grade, guy yeah. he did give an A. Well, I didn't mean to. I like the pick. I don't. I'm not thinking about it as I go to sleep at night. So it's like a B plus for me. It's good. It's okay. Good. Well, we all graded him really highly. Three point eight. It's like a like a what is that? Like a A minus. So we all love the pick. Uh, got some more. Got some depth along the offensive line potential starter can't ask for much more than that um what fifth round at this point so uh mm-hmm. sixth round this is the guy right here this is the guy mm-hmm. adam got his tight end okay <laughs> and your and, enthusiasm dj and a lot of us, Let's go, baby. and a lot of us feel pretty strongly about bucky hodges tight end virginia tech oh. is he a tight end or is he a wide receiver yeah. i don't know who knows He's a uh, wild card. <laughs> uh, he's a he's Jimmy he's a Graham. He's a he's a. He Jimmy. plays the exact same position as Laquan Treadwell. Literally, he's a split end wide receiver that's listed as a tight Great. end. Right now, like if Treadwell didn't have enough, <laughs> if Treadwell didn't have a hard enough time yeah. getting on the field, now he's got to compete with people from other positions too. Yeah, so. he is. He's competing with them right now for red zone, for red zone reps. Yeah, his Bucky so. Hodges can get out of the gym vertically. Yeah, BJ gave this thing a hard A. Austin gave it an A+. Plus. I'm giving it an A+. Plus. Adam loves tight ends. He's getting real fired up. He gave it an A. Drew and Sam all gave it an A. We gave this guy a 4.15 for the VT grade. So uh, we're, all very, we're all very riled up about this. I took some heat on Twitter because I called this guy the best receiving tight end in this class. Um, he does have some issues, right? Like he does catch with his body quite a bit. Um, but... When I said he was the best receiving tight end, I'm, I'm also taking into consideration upside, I think. This dude is an yeah. athletic freak. He's 6'6", can jump through the roof, okay? He's strong. He's going to box people out. This is the guy that you're going to line up where Laquan Treadwell was supposed to line up at the goal line, and you're going to put him over there in the corner, and you're going to say, try and beat Bucky Hodges to this ball in the corner of the end zone. And it's probably not going to happen. All he's got to work on is he's got to get his hands out in front of him, extend his arms a little bit more. Um, and work on his catching. Probably not a blocker. Probably not going to use no, him in blocking um, very much, Never. if at all. Uh, so, I don't know. Is there much? Is there anything else we need to say about Bucky Hodges? Adam, do you want to? Do you want to drop the mic on that? You covered it all. So I think oh. kind of like Isidore to me, his shortcomings are all fixable through coaching, um, and his. Strong suits, strongest suits are his size and athleticism, things that can't be taught. So I, I think at this point in the draft to get two players back-to-back that can ha- that have the potential to overcome their weaknesses as they're displayed in college, uh, that's fantastic. These guys have what it takes to be NFL starters for sure. Uh, Bucky Hodges, you can move him around. Um, you say he's not a blocker. But if he's lined up where Treadwell is as the third wideout and he's lined up against a DB or even a smaller linebacker, he's going to get in the guy's way uh, with that size. And he'll be able to overcome a DB, absolutely, uh, if asked to do so. That's not going to be his primary function. His primary function is going to be running down the 
down the uh, seam and and uh, catching touchdowns in the red zone, and that's something we absolutely needed, and something that I think Pat Shermer uh, is well equipped to uh, uh, scheme around and take full advantage of, yeah. unlike maybe a gadget player uh, like Cordero Patterson or his successors. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, I'm, I'm very excited about Bucky Hodges. Uh, two episodes ago on this thing, I kind of, when we were doing the mock draft thing, stumped for him pretty hard. And, and uh, I'm excited about having someone that big and that athletic uh, sitting behind or possibly eventually ahead of Kyle Rudolph uh, and, and adding another dynamic to the offense. Adam and I are in a dynasty fantasy league together, and Hodges is a guy that, I would love to get late, but I know I'm going to have to compete with Adam because I know he loves his tight ends and I know he loves Bucky Hodges. So I think we're be, I think we're going to be fighting over him. But uh, all right, so that that was basically all of our picks before the seventh round. The Vikings took uh, four guys in the seventh round because Rick kept trading down and acquiring those those seventh round picks. Um, so let's just hit on those really quick. I just want your guys' highlights. I'll run through the names. You guys just tell me who you like, who you don't like, and uh, and uh, and we can go from there. So Stacy Coley, wide receiver, Miami, uh, was the first seventh round pick. Uh, Afedi Odenigbo, uh, defensive lineman, Northwestern, killed the name. I even wrote it out phonetically right here. Um, so, yeah, uh, Elijah Lee, linebacker, Kansas State, and Jack Tacho, uh, cornerback, North uh, NC State. Um, so, I don't know who do you guys like from this round from those four? Um, I uh, big fan of Stacy Coley. Um, I think uh, I, I said this on the ATL pod. Um, the, 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 yeah, that was the latest episode that's uh, out right now. Go download uh, the ATL pod. About the Labor Podcast, it is terrific. Uh, unbiased take there. Um, Stacy Coley, I said that he will be, by the end of the season, he'll be the go-to slot guy for the Vikings. So uh, that was my kind of hot take that I went with, and uh, I think he's got the skill set. I think some of his traits are comparable to Stephon Diggs. So... Um, I mean, obviously, not saying he's going to beat Stephon Diggs, but I think he can be that type of player in the slot, especially. So, that was my um, my take there. And oh. then, uh, obviously, Elijah Lee too was my. Uh, I, I I thought he's a fourth round player, and I think a lot a lot of people like that pick. He fell uh, inexplicably, really. Um, big linebacker can cover well, uh, very rangy. So, uh, another great. Uh, you know, Ben Lieber even thinks he could start uh, in that other spot next to Kendricks and Barr. That's pretty high praise, and there might be some Kansas State bias pushing in on that take. But, um, I, again, I think Lee can be a, a starter even next year maybe, and that's saying a lot for a seventh-rounder. So I think Elijah Lee and Stacey Coley are my two favorites of those seventh-rounders. You think uh, Coley is a better – he's going to beat out Rodney Adams for any slot receiver duties? Well, I think they're going to be different roles, I guess, is my, I guess my opinion, because I think Coley will be a slot – primarily, like uh, Jameson Crowder, I guess, from Washington is an example, but I think Adams will just be the gadget guy that, you know, Patterson didn't necessarily run in the slot all the time. Uh, he's moving all over the place, so I think that's what Adams will do. So I guess they'll be kind of different. I don't know, maybe similar snap counts to start with, and then I think eventually Coley will have more snaps. So uh, Jack Tacho was someone that we all uh, kind of graded pretty low. Um, BJ, I think, graded him lowest. It was kind of funny because – BJ was was telling us, uh, you got to check him out, man. This guy has great hands. Maybe you'll change your grade. And then I went and looked at the grades, and BJ has the lowest grade. So he likes his hands, but he also doesn't like some other things about Jack Tacho. So uh, tell us about Tacho, BJ. You know, this is a guy that has tremendous ball skills. He's an unbelievable ball hawk. You know, the way that he's able to find the ball when it gets in the air. Um, he tracks the ball well. This is really the only crate that I think that he's playing at a professional level at currently. Um, so I think he's a good practice squad candidate and a guy that could be very good in a couple of years. He needs to improve the tackling. Um, he's got the fire. He, you know, he's willingness. Tackles like, you know, the sh he sh squares his shoulders well and he gets the spot of the ball well, but he tends to arm tackle too many things. And his end coverage is definitely questionable. That's why you move him up to safety. Looks real good out there as his own safety. Uh, probably in a Tampa 2 type defense because he can split about half the field with his skills and really, you know, play with the guys that get out onto his level. So, you know, I don't see it immediately. Um, and I don't see him developing quickly enough for the Vikings liking, which is why my grade is what it is. Uh, but this is a guy that if you can find a coach to teach him 
to use his brain more effectively because of how in- incredibly intelligent this player is. Uh, he's, his ball hawking skills are just absolutely off the charts. Um, just un- an unbelievable talent in that regard. So that's my take on Tocho. Okay, does anyone want to say anything about a Fetty really quick? Any? Go ahead, Sam. What do you want to yes, say about a Fetty? the gentleman from Northwestern, as I will refer to him. Um, I, I'm a fan. I think this is intriguing. He had 10 sacks last year in the Big Ten. And um, not – interesting, he, he's a good athlete, but basically just a bull rusher at this point. His pass rush moves are very, very limited, but he's still able to get in the backfield and get after the quarterback. Interested to see what the Zimmer coaching staff can do in developing him as a pass rusher and think he could potentially make the team. We'll see. Okay, so we've hit all the players. Um, I got a couple of questions I want to throw out there to you guys. Uh, And then we're going to go ahead and give the final VT grade for this draft class. So the first question I have, um, and I know this is running long, so we'll we'll try and move quickly. Uh, Did Spielman do enough to address uh, probably the Vikings' biggest weakness going into this draft, which was the offensive line? Um, I want to I want to preface this conversation by throwing something out there, um, which is kind of why I'm probably the lowest on this draft class looking at our grades. I mean, this is kind of my reasoning behind it. Uh, Since 2012, where Khalil was drafted in the first round, pick four, uh, the Vikings have spent one pick on the offensive line in the first three rounds of the NFL draft. And that pick was uh, (coughs) this year's Pat Elfline. Um, Over the last 10 years, Rick Spielman has spent three picks from the between the first and third rounds on offensive linemen. So my question to you guys is, is this year any different? Did Rick Spielman do enough in this uh, draft to address the offensive line? Well, I think, I think, uh, I think he did. I think, I think you have to look at his free agent signings with Reef and Rimmers um, before you, you know, kind of criticize drafting, you know, only one offensive lineman in the first three rounds and, um, and getting his Isadora late, but um, you get you solidified your offensive tackles spots that were obviously scrutinized quite a bit, and then you get an, a pro ready into your offensive lineman, and then you get a, a guy named Isadora who's got some serious potential as a starter. So, I mean, I don't know, you know, what else you could have done if you're Spielman to address offensive line, and then also, you know, not give up, you know addressing other needs that need to be addressed as well. So I, I have no problem with what Spielman did. I think he did a fine job addressing the weakest unit on the team. What about you, Sam? I would say no, actually. Um, I do like the guys that he got. I do like the way he did address it. Did he do enough? I don't think so, simply just because they had so many late-round picks. Why didn't they take a flyer on an offensive lineman? They drafted two wide receivers. Guys, I don't know why they hate Jarius Wright. He's not expensive. He can, he can play a role we've seen like He's gonna well, get basically. But they, they I, I don't know. I just think with or without right, um, there's enough depth at wide receiver, and the value of the receivers they took wasn't so great where they took them that it justified. It's just a little confusing to me why you wouldn't take one or two flyers on offensive linemen in later rounds in addition to what you did earlier on simply because of how big a problem it has been and how you know it can derail the entire season with just a few injuries. Yeah, I mean... Yeah, Go ahead. Go ahead, Adam. I think those late round flyers are already on the roster. I, I I think it's an upside down depth chart at offensive line. We've got plenty of developmental offensive linemen that we pretty much have high hopes for, other than Willie Beavers. Uh, and I, I I think the need was there to find guys in free agency and potentially the draft that they can plug and play and improve immediately. Mm-hmm. And I, I think they've done that. Uh, both offensive tackle spots, sounds like definitely the center spot, Alex Boone at left guard, and some pretty strong competition at right guard. I think this is definitely a better run-blocking offensive line than we saw last year, yep. and we all know that they can't get worse at pass blocking. They might not be much better at pass blocking, but we all know they can't get worse. Mm-hmm. Um, so we've got three uh, pretty damn talented running backs behind a highly improved uh, run-blocking unit. Uh and and some potential there for improvement at pass blocking and something to build on moving forward from this offseason and beyond. Uh, I don't know 
short of breaking the bank and trading everything that they could have done a whole lot more than what they did, other than getting Lamp instead of Cook in the second round. I just feel like we've spent so much time, I mean, and not on this particular, you know, the round table, because this is only our 10th episode, but we've talked about before, like, like Rick Spielman likes to trade back in the draft and acquire draft picks. He likes to be at around 10 picks. And we've kind of talked about why he does this and if we like whether or not he does this. And we've always kind of come to the conclusion that the more picks you have, the more likelihood you're going to hit on some of these guys, right? Especially in the later rounds. So knowing that, I don't understand how it doesn't bother bother anybody that you can have 11 draft picks and only spend two on offensive line when you're spending two on wide receiver. Well, uh, like I said, I think it's an upside. I think you're going to be cutting – uh, developmental offensive line, man. And, and you're going to be cutting. To you're going to be cutting gonna... wide receivers. Yo, you guys. Hey, you, gotta, you guys can't. You guys got to stop sleeping on Aviante Collins, the, the tackle that they picked up from TCU. He's going to make the 53. I want that on recording here because oh. he's going to make the okay. undrafted free agent out of TCU. He's an o- offensive tackle down there. He's going to play guard at Minnesota. He's going to make the 53. Call. That's three ham. Full ham sandwich right there. <laughs> it's a sandwich. That is a sandwich. His name is Avianti? Avianti Collins. Avianti Collins. Check him out on film. He's got great feet. Love it. Good lateral agility. Just doesn't have the arms to push um, and get a good, uh, you know, control guys with his arms. You know, those lanky dudes that are just kind of being able to, like, shift them like this. Um, he doesn't have that arm length. He has the, the – he's unbelievable – you know, athleticism, kind of quick twitch muscle. So I see him as – you know, I really see him as a backup guard right now so, despite falling on the draft. So I just want to say one more thing because um, I I feel like if if this if this draft was a one off it wouldn't bother me as much, but <laughs> the fact that this is Spielman's mo throughout his time in Minnesota is just what worries me. I just feel like once again we had another draft where he seemed like he wasn't really to go all in on fixing the offensive line, and we've seen it year after year after year after year after year. And I'm just tired of having to talk about the offensive line. I'm tired of having to talk about how other players aren't developing properly because of the offensive line. And we can never really seem to make a proper evaluation on anyone because you can always tie it back to the offensive line. Um, So I think that's just my biggest gripe is that the track record indicates that this potentially could be still an issue moving into next year's draft. Yeah, I mean, a lot of this stuff, too, you can't really predict and you know like Matt Khalil was supposed to, was the consensus like home run left tackle when you draft him sure. and then DJ yeah, no, I, I don't, I don't hold that against Spielman right and then with, yeah. with Clemmings you know he was a freak athlete and you know former defensive end I believe and you know flipping him then between positions over and over is definitely not good for development and you really couldn't help that either so um, it, it, there's just a lot of circumstantial you know I guess things that happened that you know all of that have played into where the offensive line is at right now, and obviously some blame goes to Spielman, but I think the circumstances uh, certainly played into it as well. Yeah, and and uh, and I do share some of your frustration, Brett. I guess, but I mean, you spent two picks on offensive lineman, two picks on receiver, and two picks on linebacker. Those are the three positions that got got the most attention. But for the most part, he drafted in all phases on both sides of the ball. And so it's, it's kind of hard to knock a guy for having a draft class. That's pretty well rounded positionally, uh, despite the need, but that need was filled in free agency. And that should be where you go out and you really try and fill immediate needs. Cause yeah. even a, even a second round center, that's not a guarantee that he's going to be there. Even your forest lamp is not a guarantee that he's going to be there. Or be I, hope he busts. I hope he busts. Mm-hmm. When forest lamp you. busts, I am going to be so fired up because you guys are still dreaming with this guy from Western Kentucky that still has so much to prove. You got him on this pedestal where he's this uber, unbelievably talented offensive lineman, and he's not even proven at a, you know, he's proven at a smaller school. He's had one great game against Alabama. I mean, I just think you guys are absolutely way too high on a guy that could step in and just get absolutely mauled at the NFL level. So we're kind I'm of excited. For, I'm calling. I'm calling the bus now. Sure, yeah, it's a little. Now. It's a little well, tongue I, in cheek too. I mean, the lamp. Yeah. I, I know mean, it's a yeah. kind of. I know it's a kind of joke, but there's some sincerity to it. There so is. I'm yeah. just saying, there like, is. 
I, I know. Like, I, I know you from. both were very passionate about your uh, your lamp, mo like moving up to get lamp, and the fact that it was on the table. I can see how that's frustrating from what you guys were just talking about. But in the same breath, I just think that in a couple, you know, in about two years, when Dalvin Cook is starting to establish himself as a top ten, top five running back in the NFL, we won't even know who Forest Lamp is anymore. So there's your there's your future take on that. I um I think that we could all agree that this draft was well rounded and good enough that in analyzing sure. it there has to be a certain amount of nitpicking and I feel like that's I feel like that's what I'm doing like overall I I can't really argue with too many of these picks you know right. and so um yeah I I have no idea if Forrest Lamp's good or not I've never seen him play once I've never turned on a game he's in I got excited and I love offensive linemen that's it love them so so did you guys think uh, go ahead Adam. I was going to say, if I have one complaint, and maybe one of you guys can explain this to me, why did we draft Stacy Coley and Rodney Adams immediately after letting Cordero Patterson leave for a very reasonable salary? I think Their salaries are more reasonable. That's a good point. Their salaries are even more reasonable. With, yep. and with, yeah, Patterson, with, uh, practice, yeah, with Patterson, I think there was a lot more going on than that. Patterson is pretty fond of Cordero Patterson, and I think that rubbed a lot of people in that building the, long, the wrong way, and I think his production just didn't justify keeping him and dealing with him. We always talk about distractions with different stuff, you know, off-field stuff and whatever. I bet Cordero Patterson was a distraction on that team at, from time to time, and I think they just got sick of it. That's my opinion based on nothing. Right, yeah. yeah. I mean, his role is inherently being diminished. I mean, the kick return is being slowly eliminated as well. So um, taking a late-round guy to be a kick returner and possibly be a gadget guy, I can see why they did that. But, Pat, I mean, that's a good point you bring up because looking at what Patterson's salary is in Oakland now, it makes a lot of sense that they would they would have maybe been aggressive to keep him. But I'm with you, Adam, and that's why I graded that pick probably the lowest of the group. Mm -hmm. I guess if, if I take issue with one whole collective narrative this year, it's that we let Patterson walk for that amount of money. And let's keep in mind, he's quite possibly the best NFL kick returner of all time, regardless of how much it's been diminished. This isn't the first year that that has been diminished. It's been diminished since he's entered the league gradually, and he's still managed to become the best. Oh, yeah. Statistically, one of the best NFL kick returners of all time and give us that field position advantage. And we just let him walk and we replace it. We, we spend a draft pick on him instead of some more ham or, you know, Aaron Jones who went to the Packers and really upset me or whatever. Uh, that, that just I like this take. That I like just this take. This is good. The Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I thought you, I thought you were finished. I, was just, I, I like the passion and the fire on that take, Wars. You could get the – See the decibels rising in your in your voice inflection as you went on with that. Admit it. Right. Here's my only question, <laughs> and this is definitely not the way you want to look at anything because he's an outlier. But what would Bill Belichick do? Would he say we need to keep Corey L. Patterson, or would he say no? I'm going to find somebody in the sixth, seventh, fifth round that's going to be. <laughs> Dude, this back-to-back -back really fire takes by both of you guys. W W B B D. I don't know. You know what I'm saying? I think you're I, both right. I think you're both yeah. right. Okay, but what but would I he do? What would those he Those guys done? aren't going to be the kick returner he is. Dude, Rodney Adams has very little value. What, what Wars brought up about how that the kick return spot is being diminished, he has essentially zero value, immediate value, for example, they were to take the kick return role out of the NFL. My, my grade on him goes from A to F immediately because this guy, he has zero pop. He's like Curtis Samuel with less polish all the way around if he's not returning kicks. So I kind of think the Warriors is on to something hot here with saying that Vikings made a mistake letting Patterson go just to replace him with a guy that's trash compared to him and has absolutely zero, very little upside as a receiver because of his strength. Well, and, let's, and let's, let's say that you turn out to be right, and, I, and I'm not saying that you won't, but let's say Rodney Adams has no other redeeming traits as a wide receiver, right. as you say, uh, but I haven't watched the film of Rodney. Very little functional strength, terrible route runner, but, standard Patterson stuff. But is that level of bad really anywhere close to the level of bad that we all started piling on Patterson for? I mean, he showed the ability to be a productive receiver at times, not consistently. Especially, especially last year, too. 
But And he also showed the ability to be a running back in this league, not to mention the league's best kick returner. So I just don't understand the need to let him walk at a reasonable price and and uh, draft the guy that's not as good as him. Exactly. You should write this out. You should write this, write this out, Warwick. I think that you have a really nice case here, to be quite honest with you, because I've got no response to that. I think yeah, that I never, I never thought about this as a as an issue. Neither did I. Patterson, yeah. Adams, Adams thing. It's a really yeah. It's a and let, well, unless Patterson left by choice, this take is on the money. Yeah, if the none of us really are to walk, to It's on the money. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I will say this though. The Vikings essentially drafted three wide receivers, if you count Bucky Hodges as one as well. Bucky Hodges. That that might, maybe I'm overthinking it, but it might say something about like Juan Trenbell as well. No. I'm just, uh, I mean, why would you draft three, two and a half wide receivers if you just got a guy in the first round last year? To I be don't know. We don't draft for stuff. need. We fill needs through free agency, it's, right, Adam? It's a definite know. concern. This, is, this year will be very telling for Laquan Treadwell. Oh, yeah. This is a – I don't want to call it a make or break yeah. year, but uh, maybe. That will be year three. Especially now, too, with Michael Floyd. If Michael Floyd comes in, where where, where is Treadwell going to play? That, what is his role going to be? Yeah, that, that's – if they brought him in, that would – He doesn't yeah. have a role in it. He doesn't should, have a role. We right. should say that um, for people watching, if you didn't already know, the Vikings have been linked – um, talking to... I did it. I did it. I linked it. I know. I, just was, I wasn't sure if you wanted it. Okay, so awesome. Yeah, I'm um, fine. I mean, I, I put it out there. If I'm wrong, then... Yeah, okay, so... Uh, I'm not. So I'm BJ not, so. can confirm that the Vikings have talked to wide receiver Michael Floyd, previously of New England, um, previously of Arizona, and he's uh, previously from Minnesota. So uh, he may be coming back home and joining a already crowded uh, wide receiver group with the Vikings. And I think if that happens, then that throws a whole nother uh, uh, issue into that group. So um, we'll see what happens there. Uh, I got one more question for you guys, then we're going to wrap this thing up because I think we may be in episode 11 now. Actually, um, I I may have to sp- I may I may split this thing up and just uh, and maybe tease people with the second half of it in a later episode or something. Um, Rick Spielman, Trader Rick, do you guys think there was too much trading in this draft? Do you think at times he was moving back because he has an addiction to moving back in the draft and acquiring more picks, whereas there were potentially some picks that he could have made instead of moving back to gain potentially more value? Um, I know he moved moved up just as often as he moved back, right? No, he moved up twice, moved back five times. So there were total seven Mm -hmm. trades in this draft. That's a lot of trades. I think I I thought (laughs) I saw someone trade say that's the most that he's ever had in a draft. Um, I don't. Well, he's he's notorious, and he's talked about it. Notorious is the wrong word, but his strategy is to kind of fill needs and go best prospect available. by moving around to get to fill that need and still get a value by moving to the right spot to to accomplish both and i think that's what he tries to accomplish when he moves around so much right i i guess my question is is are there enough roster spots on this team to warrant drafting 11 players in this draft no but you're giving yourself more cards in the deck because this whole thing is inherently a crapshoot you're giving yourself more opportunities to hit and I think that's what he's... And the fact that he's shown he will move up, and he did it twice on day two, I believe, to get the yeah. right player is the reason that it doesn't bother me that he's also trading back, too, because he's not just trading back to trade back. He's trading back because obviously he doesn't see the value of where they are currently, and he'd rather yeah. stockpile. Pick. I mean, he definitely yeah. showed some wizardry moving up and then gaining more picks after moving up twice. Right. I mean, I think that definitely de- deserves some respect. There were just a couple times where... You're just looking at it, and I can't name any particular players off the top of my head, but there's some there's some guys falling at positions of need that you're looking at, and and Rick keeps acquiring more seventh round picks, and you're just kind of like, you know, well, we're, we're, the what's the end game here? Rounders is they have the same like the seventh rounders have the same hit rate as like fifth and sixth rounders, so I think that's what he was doing with all these seventh rounders is he's trying to, you know, I think, I think it's like twenty six percent or something like that. Bj right? Bj and was it, was it BJ and Jordan when you guys talked about the term lottery lottery ticket with yeah, seventh rounders? Yeah, yeah lotto, t- lotto tickets. Getting as many lotto tickets as you can. So, 
It's, it's but, the perfect term for it's literally what it is because you're, you're it's, Sam said it best to crap shoot and you're just buying as many getting as many balls rolling as you can and eventually you hope that if one of those seventh rounders pans out just one yeah that's an unbelievable seventh round yeah yeah if 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 you have three draft picks and two of those guys turn out to be studs is that a successful draft what's Maybe, what is yeah. stud I mean, can you elaborate stud? Like, Long -term ten years, stud. ten year starter? Absolutely. Ten year starter. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Now, if you have eleven draft picks and two of those guys turn out to be starters, did you have a worse draft? No. Mm. Mm. You're doing the LeBron James like, hurting top like with Tom Brady and LeBron James showing up in the Super Bowl and you people are taken away from them for losing in the championship. Same idea here. With I because you have more opportunities, it makes the class worse. But really, it doesn't because he started with the same amount of picks. You, 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 got, you got the same amount of production out of it. My point is that the odds of you getting two starters out of 11 picks are a lot greater than two starters out of three picks. I think there's an accuracy by volume uh, dynamic at play that, that I mean, if the right. draft – if the draft were an exact science, then it wouldn't be this much fun. And, well, I mean, there's different you, things here. I think you're, 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 there's the how well this draft played out, but then there's also the evaluating talent part. So there's two different things. Like he's, he's his, you know, evaluating talent performance was bad. If he went two for eleven compared to two for three, but overall production from the draft is the exact same. Yes, and there's the human aspect that's going to play into it. There's the that's why it's. Best prospect available. Will Devin, Delvin Cook be the best player available at 41 when we look back at this in 10 years? Probably not. Even if he's very good, he's probably not going to be the best player that was available at 41. Um, but he was the best prospect available, and that's pretty much unquestioned no matter right. who you talk to. Not a good point. You guys are killing me, though, with this because I feel like you're proving my point, my earlier point about – did he do enough to address the offensive line issues? I was with you on that one. I said no. Yeah, so, I mean, I feel like you guys are saying what I was saying, that you have a better likelihood of hitting if you have all of these draft picks, but he didn't use any of that well, to I try and hit on line. the offensive line. Yeah, Basically, but what we have here is we, we have a team ham, man. and then we have, like, a team non-ham, which is you guys, like tofu or, like, team tofu, let's say That's that. And Brett and I are team ham. Sorry, I'm over ahead. there. No, no, if you went into Mankato with 30 offensive linemen, A, how well are you going to be able to evaluate each of those individuals? B, you're not going to have that much time to evaluate them very well. And C, there's guys already on the roster that are developmental, like I said, that I think they have faith in mm -hmm. um, at each spot. And so I, I understand what you're saying, that you wanted more ham, but – the, the reality of the situation is that they're trying to put, find starters yeah. uh, that can contribute now because I, I do think they have some hope for you guys like Clemmings and Karen and right. some of the others. I, I think they've got some hope for those guys as developmental prospects. <laughs> Drew, do you know you're on camera right now? What? <laughs> <laughs> Adam, also, if you're going into camp with 30 offensive linemen, the strain on the caterer would be almost too much. And then the, the restrooms, I don't know how they're going to survive. So I would agree with you. It's probably not a great They'd have point. to make it the last year it happens in Mankato. They won't be. <laughs> All right. We're going to wrap this thing up. I'm going to run through really quick, give the, give the group grades for each player, and then our overall grade. Dalvin Cook, A-, minus. Pat Elfline, A-, minus. Jaleel Johnson, B+, plus. Ben Gideon, C+. Rodney Adams, C+, plus. Danny Isadora, A-, minus. Bucky Hodges, A+, plus. Stacey Coley, B-, minus. Afedi Odenigbo, B-, minus. Elijah Lee, A, Jack Tacho, C+, plus. for a final weighted grade of B+. Plus. So that's the, that's the <laughs> VT... 2017 NFL draft consensus grade B plus. Um, I'll say we add Sam Bradford to that and call it an A. There you go. There you go. Oh, yeah. There you go. Love it. There's a good close out. Drop the mic. Doing? Drop the mic on that. Just shut it down right now. That's shut it down. I can't shut it down without telling people to like. They have to like the video. They need to subscribe to our YouTube channel. 
okay? They need to leave a comment because we reply to every comment that gets left on these videos. Every single one of them, we reply to them. Um, and then I can't leave without telling them that they got to visit vikingsterritory.com because we're going to continue to have, uh, we have our Welcome to the Big Show series coming out that we do every year where we take a, a dive into each one of these players uh, and, and tell you about the newest Vikings. And uh, all that's in addition to the usual content that we have over at vikingsterritory.com. So thank you guys. I think I, we are probably in episode 11. I'm not sure how I'm going to do the intro for episode 11, but I probably am going to split them up at this point because we went super long. Um, but I appreciate the time, and uh, I appreciate the viewers watching this one. So see you guys. 